All right, folks, welcome back to AWS Simplified, the place where I teach you everything there is to know about AWS. And today we're going to be talking about AWS step functions, and this is going to be an overview of why they're useful and why you should probably be using them. Just before I continue on to the video, I'd highly suggest to take a look at my previous video where I give you a walkthrough of how to set up a step function with a Lambda. And I'll give you a link in the description and as a thumbnail on this video right now. So here's a quick summary of why step functions are useful and why you may want to use them. So step functions allow you to create workflows and that follow a fixed or dynamic sequence. And that's where the steps name comes from. Uh, so for instance, in a traditional application, you may want to get an API request. You may want to write to some kind of database. And depending on what was already there, you may decide to proceed to the next step. You may decide to just return. And if your database call fails, then you return right away. Uh, step functions allow you to model this as independent units. And these independent units or these tiny tasks um, can reach in and directly interact with AWS resources, such as Dynamo, SNS, Lambda, to go and perform some job and re return the response back to the step function. So it's almost as if step functions are an orchestration for an application. Um, something that's really great about them that you don't really have to worry about if you use step functions uh, is that they have built-in retry functionality and you can set this up however you want. You can set this up so you retry three times, say if you're trying to write to Dynamo or SNS or something. Uh, you can have no retry policy and you can also define attributes of your retry policy. So if you want to do exponential backoff uh, or linear, you can define those settings um, as part of your retry policy. And perhaps the most important or the, the greatest benefit of step functions is that they natively integrate with AWS services such as Lambda, SNS, SQS, Dynamo, and many others that they're constantly adding. So instead of doing legwork where in a traditional application you need to you know, write your accessor classes, you need to get your IAM rule set up and make sure that everything is set up correctly in your code, um, this, these integrations are defined in what's called an ADSL language, uh, which is a step functions kind of JSON-like language where you define steps and you chain those steps together. And one of those tasks within the chain could be interacting with an AWS service, such as Lambda or SNS in this case. And from a user perspective, it's truly great in terms of auditing where you are in your application. Uh, so if you're progressing through um, your step functions, say you write to Dynamo, then you write to SNS, and then you write to S3, it gives you a very feature-rich uh, GUI or graphical user interface that helps you identify where in, in the application flow you are and kind of keep track of it. So it's very easy to identify what the input and output was from one step to another, and also quickly identify if one step failed and where the, where the gaps are uh, if your step function goes down or if your step function starts failing. And finally, um, another obviously great feature that we come to expect of AWS, uh, highly scalable and very low cost. So it's two and a half cents for every 1000 state transitions. So to put this in a more practical um, perspective, say you define a state machine uh, as part of your step function that has five transitions and you have 100,000 invocations of those per month that costs you $12.50. That's a pretty good deal in my mind. So I figured the best way to explain how this actually works was to give you a practical example. And in this example, I'm gonna tell you about this hypothetical credit card processing application that I like to use and how you may model this in the traditional sense. So without using step functions and having a server that's processing all this logic. So let's assume for a moment, you have something called a transaction processor service, and this can be on EC2, it could be Lambda, it could be whatever you want. And its role is to basically orchestrate interactions with multiple services. Uh, there could be, you know, pin authorization comes to mind um, to make sure that you're the actual person or the pin is valid uh, before it kind of commits the transaction. There's the step where you may want to commit the transaction to the, the credit card provider like Visa, MasterCard, whatever. And then maybe there's a step at the end, depending on the if the prior two succeeded, maybe you want to tell the world about it. You want to broadcast that to an SNS topic so other customers or other kind of co-teams can find out about it, right? So let's start with this. So we have a credit card purchase request that comes in and hits this EC2 server. Maybe it's hosting a REST API. And this is what a request may look like. So we have a customer ID. It's this random number, credit card number, provided PIN, and an amount. Uh, so the first step that you may want to do is store an audit log. So you want to keep track of who, when, uh, who and when people try to submit transaction requests to your service. 
okay? So what would this require? Well, you need to set up a DynamoDB client and then you need to write to the table. Um, from there, provided the, the step two succeeds or the, the write to DynamoDB succeeds, you probably want to proceed to the next step, which is to authorize the pin. So we may reach out to this pin authorization service, could be on site or could be some kind of external um, visa endpoint that you're hitting. And let's assume that it can reply yes or no, like accept or reject. If it accepts, then you want to move to the next step. If it rejects, then you want to return a response all the way back to the other end, right? And then uh, uh, the fourth step is provided the authorization step is successful, you actually want to commit the transaction to some kind of credit card authority service that I'm calling down here. And assuming this goes right and you were successful at committing the transaction, uh, you, maybe you want to tell the world, so you want to broadcast that to, a, to an SNS topic that you own. Okay, so this is kind of the hypothetical application that we're dealing with. So let's do like an exercise here. Let's think about this um, from a logical perspective of how you would implement this. So if I were implementing this, what would I do? So I'd have this EC2 machine that's hosting a REST endpoint, right? And I'd probably write my code such that first thing I do is try to write to a DynamoDB table, right? Maybe that succeeds, okay? And then the second thing I do is I wanna authorize the pin. So I call authorization service. Now two things could happen. Well, actually three things. They can accept, they can reject, or they can throw an exception. So the accept and reject aren't very interesting cases because if they accept, we proceed. If we if they reject, then we just come back all the way out the other end. But what happens if they throw, the, throw an exception? They're hard down for a little while, right? This happens. Services go down sometimes. So what does that mean for you? Well, it means that this credit card purchase request, like what's going to happen to it? It's going to fail, right? Because you failed at this step. And then at some point later, whoever made this request is going to have to come along and resubmit the request. And then when they resubmit it, what's going to happen? You're going to create a new request log, right? And then when they submit the request, you're going to repeat the same process. You're going to try to authorize the pin again and call the service. Maybe it's still down, maybe it's not. But basically, you need to reset your context. You need to retry the entire suite of events or the entire sequence of events that led up to this point. Right? And that's not a very scalable thing, because if you think about this, if you need to retry these steps, that means that someone needs to come along, make a new request, and then you need to write a new row to your DynamoDB, right? So there's, it's waste on that level. Um, so that's the kind of use case that step functions help solve. So they help you orchestrate the sequence of events that you kind of code into your step functions so that provided this fails, you can have some kind of retry policy. You can have a wait time that says, okay, don't, don't fail right away. Re wait maybe 30 or 40 seconds or a minute or five minutes, whatever you want. So you can build in these retry policies and these rich functionalities to uh, drive your workflow as opposed to doing it all through specific um, sequential code. So that's the, the use case that step functions are trying to solve, okay? So now let's actually look at how this can be done using step functions. And so I actually wrote the ADSL, which is uh, the language that you use um, to write your step functions in AWS step functions. So this is the output of it. And I've actually just kind of superimposed the resources that I'm interacting with because it's not obvious unless you are actually looking at the ADSL code. So, so what happens here? So we start off with processing the transaction, right? And the input is the same. We have the customer ID, we have the cost or the purchase amount, and then we have the credit card number and the pin, right? So the first thing we wanna do is store the history. And this is extremely easy to do in step functions, as opposed to writing the code yourself where you actually need to call DynamoDB, do all this extra stuff, it's brain dead simple. So here's an example of how it works. So you, you define a task, it's a store history, sorry, you define a state, and this state is a type task. And the resource that you're gonna be act interacting with is DynamoDB, and specifically, you're gonna to try to put an item there. And we're gonna specify some parameters, right? And the parameters are as such. The table name is this table name, and this is the content of what I want to write to my DynamoDB. I want the transaction ID, which is the primary key of the table, and I, this notation is basically saying, take the input of what was fed into the state machine originally, so transaction ID, and save that to my DynamoDB table. You can obviously include much more context here if you wanna include the pin, actually, probably not, never wanna include details like that. Um, but if you wanna include stuff like timestamps, things like that, uh, you can do that very, very easily here using this ADSL notation. 
And then from there, you can define a retry policy. So if this fails the first time um, on any error, so here's the error that we're kind of catching, I wanna attempt three times. And my intervals between the attempts are going to be three. So three max attempts and one second intervals in between each. And then provided this actually works, then we wanna move on to the pin authorizer, which is this next step, right? And then the pin authorizer, as I described in the, the example previously, you may want to reach out to some service to determine whether or not the pin that was provided is actually valid or not. And that service is going to return one of three things, like I said before. Uh, so it's going to return an accept or reject or an exception. If it throws an exception, you can potentially move this to end immediately, or you can do something more dynamic, like you can define a rejection step that exists over here. And in the case that it's rejected, you can do something, or you can return that response direct, directly back to your client. So let's assume that you the pin was either accepted or rejected, right? So that input or that output from the pin authorizer gets fed to the input of the pin decider. So if this returns accept, then accept is piped into the pin decider, and this can take two branches. One is success. If it moves, if it was accepted, then you move to the success step. If it failed, then you move to the rejection step. And if it failed, then you, if it was rejected, then you end, you're done, right? There's nothing left to do. However, if you succeeded, then we want to move on to the next steps, right? So as I was talking about before, now we know that this user is authorized. Now we want to call this authority service to actually try and commit this transaction. And we can call that service through a Lambda function. So we can pipe the, the amount, all the details that are, are used in this transaction into this Lambda, it, and it can actually call that service. And there's two kind of situations here. You can either succeed or you can fail. And if you fail, then the transaction is failed and then you're done. However, if you were successful, then you move on to the success step. And as we said before, if we're successful, we want to tell the world about it. So we broadcast that SNS message so that other clients can consume it. So the, the emphasis here is to show how easy it is to set this up. And I hope I made it clear by showing you instead of having to write all this complex code that, hands the, that handles these partial failures, it's very, very easy to integrate with all these AWS resources using the ADSL language. And I also have an example here for how it works with lambdas. So you can see with lambdas is even more brain dead simple. You just provide the state that you want to map to this task and it's a type task. You provide the ARN of the resource, which is the pin authorizer, and then you give it the next step. So depending on what this kind of returns, um, you can pipe that output into the input of the pin decider, and then it can branch off and perform some logic depending on whether or not it was accepted or rejected. So hopefully you found these videos useful. In my next one, I'm going to actually show you how to set all of this up using all of these resources. So we're going to be creating the Dynamo table, the Lambdas, the SNS topics, and really creating this example using the real resources that go along with it. So I'm going to be, it's going to be an end-to-end -end tutorial, and it'll be in my next video. So that about wraps this video up. Uh, thank you so much for watching. And if you have any topics you'd like me to cover, please feel free to drop me a message below. And don't forget to like and subscribe. Thanks so much, and I'll see you next time.